Hello and welcome to today's edition of Frightfully Forgotten Horror Movies. Today we have a Patreon request. This is requested by Damien and we're going to be reviewing 1989's The Woman in Black. But before we get going, what are we drinking? What the hell are we drinking? We're drinking the Demeter's Fate, Russian Imperial Stout. The Woman in Black was directed by Herbert Weiss. He mostly did British TV. The screenplay, however, was done by Nigel Neal. He did the screenplay for Halloween 3. Then had his name taken off it because they <laughs> changed too much and he didn't want anything to do with the movie. Right, yeah. He's also the writer for the show The Quatermass Experiment that influenced John Carpenter. Prince of Darkness, you see, written by Martin Quartermass. Yeah. Yeah, he used that name because he liked the show so much. Adrian Rollins is in this. Harry Potter's dad. <laughs> yeah. The Woman in Black starts off with our main character here, Arthur Kipp, going to work. He's a solicitor. North Americans, that means he's a lawyer. <laughs> Boss tells him that his longtime client, Alice Drablo, had just passed away and he wants Arthur to go to her estate and basically take care of everything. He also gives him shit. Clean yourself up for God's sake. <laughs> He's an asshole. <laughs> Arthur says goodbye to his family and then hops on a train and he meets Sam Tuvey along the way and they start talking and befriend each other. They get to the station on the other end and Arthur doesn't really have a way to get to the inn, so Sam gives him a ride. Arthur gets to the inn and kind of says that he's here to take care of the estate at the Eel Marsh house. Put off by it. They don't yeah. really want to talk about it or much to do with him or anything. So he's kind of already deemed an outsider. The next day, he attends the funeral. Him and the solicitor, and that's it. She doesn't have any friends or family. He sees this mysterious woman in black standing in the distance behind all these tombstones, and then she just kind of disappears. He's going back into town, and... This cart of all this wood gets into this accident and all the wood starts falling off the cart and almost falls on a kid and kills a kid, but he able to grab the kid out of the way in time. So Arthur has now got to go to the Eel Marsh house and the special driver has to take him there because it's on a causeway and the tides come in, floods the whole area so you can only get in specific times and the driver knows when to come in and out. So when they arrive at the house, he takes him into the back where there's this like generator room and he starts pumping that wheel yeah, and everything yeah. to get the electricity going in the house. <laughs> like his reaction, electric light? Yeah, it's a new <laughs> a new thing, electric light. <laughs> he goes to the family plot, he sees that woman in black that's a little closer now and she actually starts to move towards him. Sort of shits his pants, he, <laughs> he takes off into the house. He starts going through her things too to try and make an inventory of what she has. He comes across this old recorder. You can hear Alice talking about strange occurrences happening in the house, right? And that she's seeing somebody too. He gets lost in the fog. He keeps hearing like a cart splashing into the water and like these blood curdling screams. He starts panicking a little bit, right? He doesn't know if it's the guy coming or if he's just hearing things or what. He meets up with Mr. Tuvi again and Mr. Tuvi proceeds to tell him the tale of a legend that whenever you see this mysterious woman in black, it's always preceded by the death of a child. The child was supposed to die under that wood and everything, but he saved that kid. Who's got to pay the price for this? Who has to pay this woman in black? Yeah. And that's where we're going to end the plot. If you want to see what happens with Arthur and Mr. Tuvi. Mr. Tuvi. <laughs> Mr. Tuvi. Keep watching. It's a great example of making a very simple horror movie and make it simply effective. <laughs> yeah. Perfect example of less is more, right? This movie is a ghost story and that's exactly how the movie plays out. A dialogue driven movie like this, right? It's all a story. And the fact that they keep all the scares to a minimum, when there is a scare that happens or something that he sees at the house, it makes it more effective because you're not being bombarded with all these stupid jump scares and scary images throughout the whole movie. That's it's, right. It, they pick and choose these critical little moments when to when to get you. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And, and when they do get you, it works because you've been waiting. It's, it's been building towards that, mm -hmm. right? There's certain scenes where you're waiting. It's like, okay, somebody's maybe in the background and nothing's there. Yeah. It's like, <laughs> oh, okay, well, something's going to happen soon. It's a great example of a slow burn. The dialogue in this movie is perfect, too because it moves the story along. It moves, it helps to drive the entire movie. The characters that deliver the dialogue 
are great. They're exactly what you need. Adrian Rollins does a great job of kind of carrying this movie on his back because Pretty for much. most of the movie, it's just kind of him alone in the house. Yeah. Then Mr. Toovey comes in every once in a while, but mostly it's all on his shoulders. The mystery of this movie is great too because you're always wanting to learn more about this mysterious woman in black, what the house is all about too. The way they build the mystery is great too, the pacing of the mystery. Because like before you even get to the house, you're like, what is about this house that everyone's so scared about? Yeah. And when you finally see it, when he gets there with the driver, it's like, oh, that place is kind of creepy. What's going to happen in there? Like, what's in there? You know, it's just the way they build it is really good. You don't see much in this movie, but you hear about everything. Yeah, I'd say they use sound cues more than they do visual cues as far as providing scares and providing like creepiness and mysteries. Yeah, you don't see much, but you do hear a lot. The sound of that cart crashing and that woman screaming, it's like, it's kind of blood curdling. You hear it, you can make those m images yeah. up in your own mind. And it's also easier to question something that you hear rather than question something you see. Exactly. So because he's always hearing things, he questions it more. Yeah. Is that real? I don't know. Mm -hmm. What was that? If you see it, you're like, ah, I fucking saw it. All the surrounding characters around him say, oh yeah, well, you just heard noises from miles away and the, yeah. the mist carries it and stuff yeah, like that. Yeah. It's like, well, he doesn't really think no, so, no, right? No, that bullshit. <laughs> and I always like the way they use the sound, like with the horses, the crash, right? Every time you hear a horse neighing in this movie now, you question it. You're like, yeah. is he hearing it or is there really a horse outside that building to come pick him up or what? You, you start questioning your own sanity a little bit too, as well as his. And there's some really scary scenes in here that are played out perfectly. The scene where he's kind of lost in the mist. He's hearing all that crashing. Like, it's a great scene. The atmosphere, you can, again, you cut it with a knife. <laughs> yeah. There's a great scene where he hears his ball bouncing in this room and... He goes to open the door and it's locked and he's fucking trying to get in. He can't open this door. He runs to go grab an axe and he comes back and the door's open. Yeah. What's in that room, right? And he mm -hmm. goes in the room all slow and you can just hear his, his breathing. He's panting as he's opening up this door. It's like super creepy. And that works on so many levels because is it a ghost? Or is there somebody in the house with him? Yeah. And both are equally scary. The woman in black herself is creepy too, right? And the way they sort of play things out with her, they keep her at a distance at first, and every time he sees her, she gets closer and closer, right? Yeah. <laughs> That's creepy. Yeah, exactly, because it's like she's getting more comfortable with him or yeah. something, right? Yeah. It's like, ugh. Chilling, you know, yeah. a very chilling look on her face, like, no expression. Why yeah. are you here? Yeah. You don't know why, because she doesn't look angry or sad or happy or anything. Just watching him. Just watching. And this movie, in my opinion, has one of the best jump scares I have ever seen. I think it's up there with, like, The Exorcist 3 jump scares being one of the better jump scares in horror. It actually kind of shocked me and scared me a bit. I would have liked to have been shocked or scared. You wrecked it for me. Ah! Jesus Christ! Jesus Christ! Jesus Christ! Oh, oh man. I'm watching a woman in black. It's got one of the best jump scares I've ever seen in my life. And trust me, you'll never see it coming. Ah, all right. Woman in black, here we go. <laughs> Saw it coming. And the music in this movie, or the lack thereof music, is great. The fact that there's not much music throughout this movie really helps the dreariness mm -hmm. and the atmosphere. And then when there is music, they use it very sparingly, but at specific points where, okay, now it matters. That's right, yeah. And <laughs> when it kicks in, it's chilling and blood curdling the string yeah it's, oh man it's... yeah, yeah. <laughs> it allows the movie to speak for itself yeah. right which is great it doesn't overshadow anything yeah. something that i think modern horror could learn from is you don't have to have a musical cue all the time for everything yeah it spoils it yeah let the movie breathe a bit on its own and the atmosphere of this movie is perfect it's one of the best atmospheres in a horror movie that I've ever seen, really. Yep. You feel like when he's when he's cold out in the marshes yeah. and stuff like that, you feel everything. They do a great job of putting you 
in that moment. And I think the fact that they shot it on location really helps. Like mm -hmm. they, they shot it where it's supposed to take place. They do a great job of sucking you into that time period. It's perfect. There's not once that you don't believe that this takes place in 1920. Mm -hmm. I like all the little gadgets, right, yeah. that put you there. Yeah. Like that phonograph thing or whatever. Yeah. Everything's a novelty right now, which yeah. is neat, right? Even electricity, for God's sake. Yeah, like, like for example, like Sleepy Hollow is kind of supposed to take place in that general time period. But it's, it's a Hollywood yeah. time period. This doesn't feel like a Hollywood time period piece. Mm -hmm. Probably because it's made for TV and it's British. This movie is such a slow burn, too, that the few scares that you do get out of it sort of are enough for, the, for most of the movie. That's what makes it a bit of a drawback for the ending, is because not much really happens. You don't get that much of a payoff at the end. No. Most of the payoff happens throughout as the movie's playing out, right? So it sort of leaves you a little unsatisfied. A little bit, yeah. The ending is a little kind of, I wouldn't say anticlimactic, but a bit of like a... It's a bit of a letdown. A bit of a bummer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And maybe that's the way it was designed, right? Because yeah. the whole movie has a feel of dread and foreboding. So it kind of ends on a low note. I think that's how it was supposed yeah. to be, right? Yeah, we're not saying we think it should have ended on a happier note. Just maybe the way it was played out was a little anticlimactic. The way it was done and mm. maybe even the way it was shot and pulled off was a little kind of like... Let's wrap it up quick. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> wrap it up. <laughs> wrap it up here. <laughs> Come on, what are you doing? Come on, what are you doing? <laughs> but besides the ending, uh, the rest of the movie is pretty fantastic. If you love slow burn British horror, that's exactly what this mm -hmm. is. And it's a perfect example of less is more horror. So if you need a break from a bunch of shitty new movies where they just bombard you, mm -hmm. bombard your senses with stupid scares and sounds, this is like, ah. Oh. It's an intellectual yeah. movie. There was a remake, Daniel Radcliffe, who plays Harry Potter, which is interesting because Adrian Rollins, who plays the main lead in this movie, plays Harry Potter's dad in the Harry Potter movie. Yeah. I don't remember much about the remake. It was pretty forgettable. All I really remember is, like, it's dark, and Daniel Radcliffe is walking around in a house a bit. Like, <laughs> that's all I really remember. But this movie... There are several things that I'll remember for a long time, you know? Yeah. That one jump scare and just the general atmosphere, it, it kind of sticks to you. So if you want a perfect example of a slow burn, less is more, simple but extremely effective movie, check out 1989's The Woman in Black. You certainly won't be disappointed. Come away feeling sort of upset a little bit, I think. <laughs> yeah. It's so, such an effective movie, right? And until next time, keep drinking. <laughs>